As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting its long shadows across the unforgiving Atlantic, a haunting narrative unfolded, stretching from the 16th to the 19th century. These were the years when slave ships, vessels of despair and agony, undertook the notorious Middle Passage as part of the transatlantic slave trade. Within the bowels of these floating prisons, one chapter remains especially gut-wrenching, the appalling ordeal faced by enslaved African women. Imagine the year is 1700, and you are aboard the Brooks, a ship infamous for its inhuman conditions, captained by men whose names have been etched in infamy. Figures like James DeWolf, an American slave trader, and John Hawkins, an early English slave trader, come to mind. Men who profited from this dark enterprise. Can you fathom the depths of despair that consumed the souls aboard these ships? What must it have been like for women, torn from their families and their homelands, their lives reduced to mere commodities? As we navigate these harrowing waters, we are confronted by the haunting account of Olauda Iquiano, a former slave who purchased his freedom and became a prominent abolitionist. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered the whole scene a scene of horror almost inconceivable. His words ring out across the centuries, a vivid testament to the horror almost inconceivable that was the reality for enslaved women aboard these ships. Join us as we delve into this deeply unsettling chapter of human history and shed light on the heinous treatment of women aboard slave ships. Welcome to the diary of Julius Caesar. The Sorrowful Symphony of the Atlantic, unveiling the horrors and scale of the slave trade. In the annals of human history, few tales are as gut-wrenching and unsettling as the Atlantic slave trade, a complex and tragic web that spanned continents, cultures and centuries. Embarking on this narrative journey takes us from the sun-soaked coasts of West Africa to the burgeoning colonies of the New World, across the treacherous expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, a vast body of water that became a graveyard for millions of African souls. The genesis of this unimaginable human tragedy could be traced to the 16th century, when the Portuguese began to kidnap Africans and ship them to sugar plantations in the Americas. But the trade burgeoned in scale with the British, French and Dutch joining the fray. Over 12 million Africans were estimated to have been transported during the period from the early 1500s to the late 1800s, but some estimates range even higher, accounting for those who never survived the infamous Middle Passage. This period was punctuated by historical figures, each playing their respective roles in the human tragedy. Men like John Newton, a slave ship captain who later repented and penned the hymn Amazing Grace, embody the moral ambivalence and eventual awakening that characterized some participants. But not all shared such epiphanies. Men like Edward Colston amassed fortunes from the trade, indifferent to the human suffering they left in their wake. While the faces and names that propelled this dark industry were numerous, so were those who opposed it. Olauda Echiano, a freed slave who purchased his own freedom, published an autobiography in 1789 that gave the world an inside look into the horrors of the slave trade. His first-hand accounts electrified the British public and fueled the abolitionist movement, becoming a catalyst for change. Instruments of torture like iron masks and thumbscrews were commonly used to subdue the enslaved and quell any ideas of rebellion. These are mere fragments of a much larger, more horrifying picture. The magnitude of the trade's impact on Africa was seismic, disassembling societies and causing lasting ethnic tensions that persist today. But let's not overlook the indelible imprint it left on the Americas. The labor of enslaved Africans laid the foundations of economies in the New World, particularly in the realms of agriculture and industry. Moreover, the trade birthed a diaspora that, despite being rooted in unspeakable suffering, became a crucible for new forms of cultural expression, from the blues and jazz to the vibrant tapestry of Afro-Caribbean traditions. Infernal Arcs, the diabolical engineering of slave ships and the nightmarish voyage of the Middle Passage. If ships could be hellscapes, the slave ships of the Atlantic trade were precisely that, crafted not for comfort, exploration, or even the more benign forms of commerce, these vessels were essentially floating prisons 
designed meticulously for the abominable task of ferrying human beings from freedom to a life of forced servitude. Such ships were the masterstroke of perverse ingenuity, epitomizing man's capacity for unspeakable cruelty. Imagine being an architect, tasked not with creating beautiful, functional spaces, but with maximizing human suffering. Such was the job of the shipwrights responsible for the slave ships. Their vision was utilitarian to its core. Cram as many human bodies into the confined wooden bowels of these vessels as physics would allow. These architects had names like James Barbot Jr., who authored detailed plans for the ships, laying down guidelines that would maximize profitability while showing scant regard for human dignity. The decks of these ships were low-ceilinged spaces, often no more than five feet high, and designed for lying down rather than standing. Shackles and chains were integral to the design, fashioned into the very framework, a chilling yet enduring testament to their purpose. Air holes were sometimes punctured into the sides of the ships, but these were woefully inadequate, contributing to the thick, suffocating atmosphere below deck. Breathing here wasn't living, it was surviving, just barely. The ships were complex mazes, designed to disorient and prevent any attempt at rebellion, and they often carried enough armament to fend off pirate attacks and slave revolts alike. And let's talk about that perilous journey known as the Middle Passage. It was a phrase that encompassed the heart of the Atlantic slave trade, capturing in succinct euphemism the physical and emotional torment endured by millions. The journey could take anywhere from three weeks to three agonizing months, depending on the winds and the competence of the captain. A seasoned slaver like Luke Collingwood, who commanded the infamous ship Zong, knew well the calculations of water, food and expendable lives, making decisions that might lead to the jettison of sick slaves to claim insurance money. A peculiarity of these voyages was the dancing routine, where slaves were brought on deck and coerced to dance to the tune of whips and drums. Exercise, the slavers reasoned, would keep the merchandise healthy for market. Another point of aberrant interest was the guinea galleys, ships specifically designed to stow away children, a whole sinister subcategory of these floating hells. As we sift through historical documents and ship logs, we find quotes that chill us to the bone. Captains wrote matter-of-factly about their cargo, using dehumanizing terms, describing losses and gains as one would inventory sacks of grain. The starkness of the language reveals the numbing efficiency of the trade, the disturbing reality of seeing human beings as commodities. These infernal arcs were not just ships, they were theaters of human despair. They were vessels that shattered families, ripped apart communities, and spilled so much innocent blood into the Atlantic that one might think the ocean itself would revolt. They were the dark antithesis to Noah's Ark. Rather than saving life, they annihilated hope, dignity, and even the very essence of humanity for those unfortunate souls they carried. Navigators in a moral storm, the ship's crew and their uneasy dominion. Picture, if you will, a ship cresting the swells of the Atlantic. Her sails are full, but the wind that propels her carries an uneasy charge. On deck, men scurry in a dance choreographed by urgency and fear. Their faces a complex tapestry of conviction, doubt, and sometimes indifference. They are the crew, and at their helm, the captain, a figure imbued with a kind of maritime royalty, holding the scepter of authority, but also the weight of moral compromise. John Newton, a slave ship captain turned abolitionist, stands as an archetype of the intricate moral dynamics these men faced. The author of the hymn Amazing Grace, Newton once held command over ships like the Duke of Argyle and the African, vessels specifically designed for the inhumane trade of enslaved people. His life as a captain was one of palpable contradiction. He held a Bible in one hand and a whip in the other, reconciling his days with prayers and his nights with the echoing cries from the ship's hold. It was not until years later that Newton would renounce his past, but he remained a living testament to the complexities that plagued the consciences of many a captain. The crewmen's lives were no less fraught. They came from different walks of life. Some were hardened sailors, others desperate men lured by the promise of wages. And while their quarters above deck were by no means luxurious, 
They were a far cry from the subhuman conditions below. Yet their privileges came at a cost. A sense of unease often permeated their days. While they didn't bear the full weight of responsibility that rested on the captain's shoulders, their hands were far from clean. Men like James Arnold, a sailor on the notorious Brooks ship, documented the lashings he administered, the shackles he tightened, in a journal that was an amalgam of nautical notes and haunting confessions. It wasn't uncommon for crew members to interact with enslaved individuals during the dreaded dancing sessions, a twisted activity where enslaved Africans were forced to move about on deck, ostensibly for exercise. Sometimes, fragile friendships formed in these surreal moments, bonds that were as confusing for the crew as they were for the enslaved. Emotional entanglements could lead to dilemmas. There are accounts of sailors being disciplined for showing excessive kindness to the human cargo, and what of mutinies? Yes, there were instances where crew members, in a swell of rebellion or perhaps a crisis of conscience, overthrew their captain. In 1730, the ship Little George became a stage for such a drama when a part of its crew staged a mutiny, albeit an unsuccessful one. Their motivations remain unclear. Was it a quest for justice or merely a play for power? The waters of morality were ever murky. The abyss below deck, a descent into the suffocating labyrinth of slave ships. If Dante had known of the conditions on board the slave ships crossing the Atlantic, he might have included them as another circle of hell. The abyss below deck was not merely a space, but a monstrous environment designed to subdue the human spirit into numbing submission. Imagine a place where darkness is a constant companion, and the air is so thick with despair that each breath feels like an act of rebellion against the inevitability of suffocation. This was the underworld of the slave ships, a nether realm far removed from the poetry of sunsets and seascapes above. Here, human beings were stowed like cordwood, arranged in calculated configurations that optimized space but paid no heed to comfort or humanity. The infamous Brooks Ship Diagram, published by the British abolitionist Thomas Clarkson in 1788, showcased the brutal efficiency of this packing system and the image became a galvanizing symbol for those fighting to end the slave trade. But it was more than physical discomfort that gnawed at the souls aboard. It was the nauseating conditions that incubated disease and despair. With no proper sanitation, the stench of human waste, sweat and decay amalgamated into a noxious cocktail that hung in the air. Illnesses such as dysentery and smallpox swept through the decks like malevolent spirits, claiming lives with indiscriminate cruelty. Life below was a perpetual twilight of semi-consciousness, punctuated by moments of abject terror. And what of fresh air and sunlight? These were rare luxuries, permitted at the discretion of the captain and crew. On some ships, enslaved Africans were brought above deck for limited periods, perhaps to be exercised in a grotesque parody of a dance, or to be inspected for disease and physical condition. Even in these moments, the chains remained, as did the ever-watchful eyes of the crew, armed and ready to quell the slightest hint of revolt. Curious facts often served to highlight the abnormality of what was considered routine. The so-called seasoning voyages, led by captains such as James Irving, were deemed necessary to acclimate newly enslaved Africans to the harsh realities of plantation life in the Caribbean. These trips would sail in a twisted loop, up the West Indies and back down, where unseasoned slaves would be exposed to the rigors of hard labor, inadequate nutrition and extreme punishment, all while still at sea. A finishing school for human degradation, one might say. As for words that encapsulate this horror, perhaps none are as chilling as those spoken by John Newton before his famous conversion, this I know, that mercy is our only hope. Newton, a slave ship captain turned abolitionist and clergyman, expressed the dark irony that those responsible for the hellish conditions often considered themselves beyond moral reproach. These were not the words of pirates or societal outcasts. They were spoken by men who returned to their homes and families, their pockets filled with the profits of human misery. Ink and iron, the vain scribbles of law on the slave ship's dark canvas, picture the parchment, taut and crisp, 
filled with quill strokes of ink that attempt to codify an inhumanity so vast it defies description. These are the laws and regulations, the ink-drenched scripts that purported to bring a semblance of order to the chaotic malevolence of the slave trade. Such legal frameworks, whether stemming from British parliamentary acts or colonial edicts, spoke in a curious tongue, a language that conflated logistics with ethics, numbers with lives, and regulations with humanity's gaping moral wounds. Let's take the notorious British Dolben Act of 1788 as an example. Named after Sir William Dolben, this piece of legislation stipulated conditions on board slave ships. How many men, women and children could be packed into these floating prisons? It was the government's pained acknowledgement that the horror needed parameters. The act specified that a ship could carry no more than five slaves per three tons of the ship's weight, attempting to offer a veneer of dignity in conditions that were fundamentally undignified. Ah, the irony. Consider John Kimber, a British captain indicted but ultimately acquitted in a famous case in 1792. He was accused of extreme cruelty towards an enslaved girl. For a brief moment, the veneer cracked. Society was forced to confront the horror. The law became both a mirror and a window, reflecting society's unease while exposing the chasm between legality and morality. Kimber's trial revealed the inadequacies of a legal system that was proficient in counting tonnage, but lacked the vocabulary to quantify suffering. Another notable aspect of this dark enterprise was the clandestine nature of the slave trade in regions like the Spanish colonies, where asientos, contracts that granted the holder permission to trade enslaved people, added another layer of so-called legitimacy. However, the asientos were often just a smokescreen, for contraband trade was rife, and many slave ships would disembark under the cover of darkness, flaunting the very laws that sought to regulate them. What did regulations mean when the very soul of the enterprise was corruption incarnate? Even when laws became more stringent, slave traders found loopholes wide enough to sail a ship through. The US Act prohibiting importation of slaves was enacted in 1808, yet illicit trade continued for decades, obscured by coded language and clandestine routes. Compliance was often a mere nod to formality, a box checked on a ledger before the ship set sail. Many ships carried surgeons' kits, ostensibly to show they cared for the well-being of the captives. In reality, these kits were more likely to be used in suppressing revolts or administering punishments. While the laws pretended to exercise control below deck, the laws of man collided violently with the laws of humanity. Those who had the gall to resist were met not with legal jargon, but with the crude rhetoric of iron shackles and wooden clubs. Olauda Echiano, an African man enslaved as a child who later bought his freedom and became a prominent abolitionist, once remarked, we are all bound upon a wheel. Indeed, laws that claim to regulate were often just cogs in that merciless wheel. Bread of affliction, the grim gastronomy of slave ships and the starving souls within. If food is a reflection of culture, a mark of civilization, then the sustenance provided on slave ships was a cruel parody, a macabre imitation of nourishment that only intensified the torments of those on board. Here in this shadowy world below deck, where light and air were almost mythological elements, food became yet another instrument of dehumanization. The entire feeding process on slave ships was choreographed not for sustenance, but for the commercial goal of delivering saleable human beings to the other side of the Atlantic. Imagine being severed not only from your home and your loved ones, but also from the very flavors, textures, and aromas that make life worth living. Enslaved Africans were usually fed twice a day, but what passed for meals were far cries from the nutrient-rich, diverse diets they were accustomed to in their homelands. The food was often a mishmash of subpar ingredients intended to meet the bare minimum requirements for human survival. A typical meal might include lobscouse, a nauseating blend of meat, flour and water, or horse beans, so named not because they were fit for horses, but because they were often deemed unfit for human consumption back in Europe. A lingering question from this dark chapter of human history is, how could ship captains and crews, many of whom were versed in the nuances of maritime law and international trade, 
so grossly miscalculate the nutritional needs of their human cargo? The answer lies in the callous economics of the trade. Men like William Snellgrave, a British slave trader, meticulously recorded the feeding regimens on his voyages, and his logs are replete with notations on how best to ration the meagre food supplies. Snellgrave was well aware that malnutrition would make the slaves less valuable upon arrival, yet his decisions were always a balancing act between the investment in food and the potential return from the sale of slaves. The consequences of this macabre calculus were predictably horrific. Many enslaved Africans suffered from scurvy, a disease caused by vitamin C deficiency, characterized by swollen gums and extreme weakness. Others succumbed to malnutrition-induced diseases even before they reached the New World. The ship's surgeons, whose roles were more about maintaining the value of the slaves than any Hippocratic oath, would sometimes try to force-feed those who resisted eating. The methods were as cruel as they were ineffective, ranging from the use of a speculum oris, a device to pry open mouths, to whippings and other forms of physical coercion. The anecdotes surrounding this grim gastronomy are hard to stomach. On some ships, like the one commanded by Captain Timothy Tucker in the late 18th century, slave rebellions were triggered not just by the oppressive conditions, but by the sheer desperation for better food. Tucker's log entries indicate that a failed revolt on his ship was sparked by the substandard provisions, a damning testament to the fact that for many, the risk of death was preferable to the agony of ongoing malnourishment. Perhaps the most haunting aspect of this sordid culinary tale is the silence that shrouds it. Diaries and logs of slavers rarely delve into the emotional aspects of these forced feedings. We have little more than skeletal facts, numbers, and transactional language to inform us. But the void speaks volumes. For every spoonful of loblolly or morsel of salted fish forced down a throat, a piece of a soul was also swallowed, ground down by the cruel gears of an enterprise that viewed human beings as items in a ledger. Chains and whips, the brutal symphony of discipline aboard slave ships. On the dark stage that was the lower deck of a slave ship, if food was the mockery of sustenance, then punishment was the distorted rendition of discipline, a brutal symphony orchestrated to maintain a perverse sense of order. To assert dominion over a mass of human beings reduced to cargo, the captains and crew employed a repertoire of punishments that seemed drawn from a sadist's handbook. Shackles and chains were merely the beginning, the introductory notes in a litany of horrors designed to quash any notion of rebellion or self-worth. It was not uncommon for ships to carry specialized instruments for the sole purpose of meting out punishment. The Cat o' Nine Tails, a whip with multiple knotted cords, was a favored tool for disciplining slaves for offenses that could range from the trivial to the non-existent. But what constituted an offense in the confined, floating purgatory of a slave ship? Believe it or not, insubordination was an elastic term stretched to encompass everything from overt acts of resistance to simply being too sick to consume the ship's meager rations. One infamous example is the account of Captain John Kimber, who faced trial in 1792 for the murder of an enslaved girl named Anne. Kimber, incensed that Anne was too ill to dance, a humiliating exercise often forced upon slaves to promote their health, had her flogged so severely that she died of her injuries. The ensuing trial in Britain sent shockwaves through society, although Kimber was eventually acquitted, a decision reflecting the callous social mores of the time. Yet, Kimber wasn't an exception. He was a product of a system that weaponized discipline to break the spirit. Lesser known but equally chilling is the story of a slave known only as K.R.U. on a ship under the command of Captain William Earle. K.R.U. was accused of plotting a rebellion, a charge often employed to justify extreme punishment. He was subjected to thumbscrews, a torture device designed to crush the thumb bones, before ultimately being executed by being thrown overboard alive and shackled, his presumed crime simply conversing in his native language with other enslaved Africans. The perverse irony was that the crew, while vicious in their punishments, lived in perpetual fear of a slave uprising. The Zong Massacre of 1781 epitomized this dread. 
Fearing that six slaves would incite a revolt, the crew threw 132 enslaved Africans overboard, a grim decision later defended in British court as a necessary jettison of cargo. And let's not forget the punishment meted out for the crime of illness. In a system that valued slaves merely as commercial assets, sickness was a liability. The afflicted were sometimes isolated, not for their well-being, but to prevent the spread of illness that could devalue the cargo. In other instances, they were mercilessly tossed overboard, as in the case of the ship La Rodeur in 1819, where an outbreak of ophthalmia led to the cruel decision to cast blind slaves into the sea. These punishments were the cruel strings and thundering percussion in the dissonant symphony of slave ship life, a soundtrack of suffering, its notes penned in the ledger books of captains and traders, its rhythms punctuated by the crack of whips and the clinking of chains. This dark music was conducted not by outlaws or monsters, but often by men who considered themselves civilized, men who would quote Shakespeare or hum a hymn as they tallied up their human profits. Foul air and fevered souls, the virulent voyage through disease and decay. If slave ships were theatres of human suffering, then disease played the role of an ever-present, malevolent understudy, always lurking in the wings, eager for its turn to occupy centre stage. With every creak of the ship's timbers, with every lurch of the ocean swell, the men, women and children shackled in the bowels of these floating dungeons lived not only in fear of the whip, but also in the haunting dread of invisible pathogens. In an environment where basic hygiene was an afterthought and medical care a macabre joke, the tiniest microbe could wield the power of a death sentence. Amidst the stale, putrid air of the slave ship's lower decks, often called tween decks, enslaved Africans were crammed in conditions so deplorable that the livestock on farms were better accommodated. No semblance of sanitation existed. Buckets served as communal toilets, infrequently emptied, spilling their nauseating contents with each tilt of the ship. This fetid setting was the perfect breeding ground for diseases like dysentery, referred to back then as the bloody flux, a condition so rampant that it was almost considered an inevitable part of the Middle Passage experience. One ship, the Brooks, became an iconic example of these horrific conditions, thanks to a diagram that abolitionists later used to show the inhumanity of the slave trade. On this ship, individuals were allotted spaces as small as six feet by one foot by four feet. In such a cramped nightmare, diseases spread like wildfire. Smallpox, dysentery and typhoid knew no boundaries, sweeping through the huddled masses with indiscriminate fury. It's estimated that on some voyages, mortality rates reached as high as 50%, but even those grim statistics only tell part of the story. One can look, for instance, at the notorious case of the Floating Hell, a ship named the Liverpool Merchant. On a voyage in 1756, its captain, Timothy Wiles, had to grapple with an outbreak of smallpox. Unwilling to risk the spread of the disease to his crew, Wiles ordered the sick enslaved people to be thrown overboard, citing the well-being of his crew and his financial interests as justification. His notes reveal that it was a necessary action to prevent a more extensive calamity. And yet, in this abyss of despair, humanity flickered like a stubborn candle in a gusty wind. Enslaved Africans brought their knowledge of herbal medicine and basic hygiene, attempting to mitigate the worst effects of disease through rudimentary treatments, even though the materials and freedom to use them were often severely restricted. Consider Nanny, a woman known as the Rebel Nurse, who drew upon her medicinal knowledge to alleviate the suffering of fellow captives on her journey to Jamaica in the early 18th century. Her whispered remedies floated through the foul air, a momentary reprieve from the constant onslaught of suffering. Then there were the ship's surgeons, ostensibly there to preserve the value of the human cargo, but occasionally displaying sparks of genuine empathy. Thomas Trotter, a surgeon aboard the Brooks, was one such anomaly. Horrified by the conditions he witnessed, Trotter became a vocal critic of the slave trade, providing valuable testimony to the abolitionist movement. His contributions were but a drop in the ocean, a fleeting glimmer of humanity in an otherwise dark chapter of history.
Invisible hierarchies, the layered darkness of gender and age aboard slave ships. When we peel back the tenebrous layers of the Atlantic slave trade, we find that the Abyss has its own hierarchy, a grim, contorted pecking order where gender and age dictated unique sufferings for men, women and children. This was no democracy of agony. Rather, it was an insidious patriarchy that brought a double layer of suffering for women and an additional vulnerability for children. Let's consider the men first. Packed like sardines on the tween decks, they were often placed furthest from the precious lanterns that provided the only light. Shackled in pairs, the men bore the brunt of the physical labor on board, whether hauling water or aiding in navigation. And yet, even in this state of abject misery, they were considered potential threats, rebels in waiting who necessitated the strongest shackles and the heaviest surveillance. Ships like La Amistad in 1839 became infamous for slave uprisings led predominantly by men, a manifestation of their subjugated role, but also a testament to their fierce resilience. Women, on the other hand, were subjected to a different kind of horror. Often separated from the men to minimize the risk of coordinated rebellion, they were also isolated for far more nefarious reasons. In the veiled corners of these floating chambers of misery, they became vulnerable to assault at the hands of the crew. Olauda Ekiano, an African man who survived the slave trade and later wrote a memoir, spoke vaguely but powerfully about the looseness and debauchery that plagued the ships. Women like Phyllis Wheatley, who was only a child when abducted, used their writing later in life to expose these unspoken injustices. Children were perhaps the most vulnerable, Regarded as less of an immediate physical threat, they were often unshackled, but faced a different set of horrors. In addition to the general deprivation, they were targets for various forms of exploitation and cruelty. A ship named the Little George, captained by Thomas Phillips in 1694, specifically engaged in capturing children, rationalizing that they were easier to manage, but failing to note their higher mortality rates due to the harsh conditions. The journals of Alexander Falconbridge, a ship surgeon, highlight the fatal neglect that led to numerous children being trampled underfoot in the cramped spaces. Yet as grim as these delineations were, they often served as the fault lines along which the enslaved formed bonds and communities. It wasn't uncommon for women to act as caretakers, not just for their own children, but for others separated from their mothers. Men formed alliances too, engaging in quiet acts of resistance like sabotaging ship equipment or forming pacts to end their lives as a way to escape their unbearable reality. We even hear of the rare but meaningful interactions between the enslaved and the few sympathetic crew members. Women and children, particularly, found fleeting instances of compassion from ship surgeons or lower-ranking sailors. Mary Prince, who published her autobiography in 1831, recounts receiving small mercies from a crew member named Ben, who gave her extra food and water. Echoes in the abyss, the resilient cadence of culture, amidst chains. Beneath the groaning wood of the slave ships, amidst the cacophony of despair and suffocation, another sound, almost ghostly in its resilience, reverberated through the fetid air. A hum, a chant, a whispered prayer. These were the defiant echoes of stolen cultures refusing to be silenced. Even as shackles weighed down their bodies, the enslaved Africans found ways to lift their spirits through fragmented but indomitable expressions of their heritage. Against all odds, culture, like a fragile seedling breaking through unforgiving concrete, found a way to flourish in the cramped, dark spaces of these vessels of misery. Imagine, if you will, the haunting melodies of traditional songs, providing a sonic counterpoint to the ship's creaking timbers and the relentless ocean waves. Songs like Oye Oyela, a Yoruba lament, were adapted into somber anthems of endurance. Though the original context was often forgotten, the sentiment carried through, morphing into spirituals and work songs that would later fuel the fires of resistance and solidarity in the new world. Here, names like Olauda Equiano resurface, as his memoir recounts instances of songs being sung a lifeline to a world left behind. Religious practices underwent a similar transformation, 
Conventional wisdom might suggest that the brutal conditions aboard the slave ships would shake one's faith to the core. But many enslaved Africans doubled down on their beliefs, albeit in clandestine ways. They repurposed Christian hymns taught by missionaries or ship surgeons into vehicles for their own spiritual messages. Oftentimes, traditional African spirituality merged with new religious elements encountered on the ships, birthing syncretic practices that would later become cornerstones of religious life in places like Haiti, Brazil, and Louisiana. It wasn't just in song and spirituality that these cultural fragments survived. Oral traditions, tales of ancestral glory and mythological beings were whispered like sacred texts from one ear to another, providing both entertainment and clandestine education for the younger passengers. For example, stories of Anansi, the West African trickster god, were told and retold in hushed voices, their subtext clear. Even the weakest could outsmart the strong if wits and cunning were employed. Remarkably, some enslaved Africans were able to carry physical talismans of their heritage with them, despite the strict prohibitions against personal belongings. Beads, amulets, or even tiny woven fabrics served as tangible connections to a life and identity that slave traders sought to erase. One of the most notable examples was the Gullah people, who managed to retain distinct elements of African culture during and after the Middle Passage, including their own Creole language and crafts. These artifacts and practices, born across the ocean in stolen hands, became treasures of immeasurable worth, cultural touchstones in a world that offered little else but brutality. Even when it came to the simple but crucial act of naming, the enslaved found ways to subvert the dehumanization they endured. Many resisted the European names forced upon them, clinging to their African names as an act of quiet but potent rebellion. A man named Kuguano, for instance, born in what is now Ghana and enslaved in his youth, remained steadfast in maintaining his African name, even after gaining his freedom, marking his resistance to the loss of his cultural identity. Rebellion on the swells, the undying pulse of resistance at sea. The salty air was thick with tension, every eye sharing a secret, every hand hiding a potential weapon, a shard of glass, a stolen nail. No matter how oppressive the conditions, how watchful the crew, the instinct for freedom is a flame that even the harshest winds fail to extinguish. The stage for such acts of courage and desperation was often the ship itself, those floating prisons that became unexpected crucibles of resistance and revolt. Far from being passive victims, the enslaved Africans aboard these vessels sometimes orchestrated elaborate acts of defiance, leaving an indelible mark on the annals of human resistance. To understand the audacity of these revolts, one must first grasp the odds stacked against them. The slave ships were designed like fortresses, layered with physical and psychological barriers to subdue the human cargo. Armed sailors patrolled the decks, shackles and chains were the cruel jewellery adorning the passengers. Yet, resistance bubbled up like a spring that refuses to be capped. We remember names like Cinque, the Sierra Leonean man who led the famous 1839 revolt aboard the La Amistad, not just for their courage, but for the sheer improbability of their defiance. Indeed, many acts of resistance had to be covert, planned under the nose of the ship's crew, often in languages the slavers couldn't understand. Subterfuge was the currency of the enslaved, and communication was rich in coded language and furtive glances. A squeeze of a hand here, an averted gaze there, these were the subtle cues that signalled a collective will to resist. When the Amistad revolt unfolded, the captured Africans used sign language and simple pidgin expressions to coordinate their actions, bypassing the language barriers among themselves and catching their captors off guard. Timing was everything. Revolts were more likely to occur closer to the African coast, before the debilitating conditions of the Middle Passage had fully sapped the captive's strength and resolve. During the infamous Zong Massacre in 1781, when the ship's crew threw enslaved people overboard to claim insurance money, there were rumors that the act was, in part, to preempt a brewing revolt. Perhaps the crew had sensed the tinderbox atmosphere, the gathering storm of resistance that had them outmanned and potentially outgunned. The outcome of these revolts was, predictably, a mixed bag. 
The La Amistad's rebels, for instance, succeeded in commandeering the ship, but were later captured off the coast of Long Island. Their trial became an international cause célèbre, eventually resulting in their freedom. But for every Amistad, there were countless revolts that ended in tragedy, recaptured slaves facing even harsher conditions, the hangman's noose or summary executions. But even in failure, these acts of defiance had their own victory. They shattered the myth of passive submission, proving that the instinct for freedom could not be quashed. Accounts of shipboard resistance found their way into abolitionist tracts, providing powerful ammunition against the slave trade. Frederick Douglass, in his autobiographies, quoted the revolutionary spirit of these sea-bound uprisings as evidence that the desire for liberty was universal, stating, the silver trump of freedom had roused my soul to eternal wakefulness. The inklings of dawn, how the dark tales of slave ships fueled the abolitionist flame. In the drawing rooms of London, the salons of Paris and the meeting halls of Boston, whispers swirled, each murmur a spark in the gathering inferno of the abolitionist movement. But these whispers were often nourished by a grueling, tangible reality, by accounts of a brutal system unfolding thousands of miles away on the decks of slave ships. Those narrations, shared in pamphlets, diaries and testimonials, became the kindling for one of the most transformative social movements in history. It was a time when pen and paper held an alchemical power, a capability to transmute horror into action. One could argue that few wielded this magic more skillfully than Olauda Equiano, formerly enslaved and later a fervent abolitionist. His autobiography, published in 1789, included harrowing accounts of his capture in Nigeria and the horrors of the Middle Passage. With keen detail, he recounted the suffocating darkness below decks, the screams muffled by the ship's wooden belly, the stench of despair. Through Equiano's words, the abstract monstrosity of slavery took on corporeal form. Readers across Europe and America were forced to confront the full scope of the tragedy. No longer could they feign ignorance or indifference. The year 1787 saw the formation of the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade in London, an assembly of souls who were touched, at least in part, by these first-hand accounts. Thomas Clarkson, a giant in the British abolitionist movement, was a man whose empathy had been set aflame by such stories. He spent years gathering evidence against the slave trade, including models of slave ships, tools of restraint, and, crucially, personal testimonies. His trunk of African evidence, displayed at various meetings and exhibitions, offered palpable proof of the inhumanity inherent in the traffic of souls. Across the Atlantic, American abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison also relied heavily on shipboard accounts to fuel their advocacy. Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator, launched in 1831, often featured searing narratives from slave ships. These accounts became part of the abolitionist canon, reprinted and shared widely to foment public sentiment against slavery. Frederick Douglass, a formerly enslaved man and a formidable intellect of the time, echoed the cries from these ships in his writings and speeches. He proclaimed, You have seen how a man was made a slave, you shall see how a slave was made a man, invoking the transformative power of personal testimony in the struggle for freedom. The influence of these narratives reached even the hallowed halls of governance. In Britain, the testimonies collected by abolitionists played a pivotal role in the debates leading to the landmark Slave Trade Act of 1807, which made the slave trade illegal in the British Empire. Similarly, in the United States, although it took a civil war and a far longer journey towards the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, the accounts from slave ships remained a moral bludgeon wielded by those advocating for the end of slavery. As we step back from the dark waters of history, it's essential to remember, we are not just reciting tales of bygone horror, we are the legacy, the living embodiment of choices made, voices silenced, and spirits unbowed. In that sense, every splash of the Atlantic still whispers names. Names like Olauda Equiano, who emerged from the depths of the Middle Passage to pen a story that would stir souls. And let us not forget the abolitionists, William Wilberforce, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner, Truth, 
who used the ink of their passion to sketch a world less given to atrocity. To fully grasp the weight of this story, one must turn to the haunting words of Maya Angelou, who said, History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. So let us be courageous, for in each of us is a drop of the same sea that bore those ships. In each of us is the potential to either perpetuate indifference or sow the seeds of empathy and change. We'll leave you with this. As the sun sets on our exploration, may it never set on our remembrance and commitment to a better, more compassionate world. The chains may have rusted, the ships may have splintered, but the echoes, ah, those shall resound across time, a chilling lullaby sung by ancestors who demand not just our tears, but our unyielding resolve. <laughs>